Welcome to Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town from the world's number one poker community. Hey everybody, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski. Thank you so much for joining us on episode number 128 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is a successful longtime professional poker player with four World Series of Poker bracelets and two WSOP circuit rings in his trophy cabinet, winning his bracelets in No Limit Hold'em, Pot Limit Omaha, Raz, and Seven Card Stud High Low. This player has been proficient in all forms of the game to the tune of almost $5 million in live tournament earnings alone. Not only that, but his name translates as The Fisherman in his native tongue, and he's also known by his nickname, The Italian Pirate. It's Max Pescatore, and on today's show, we will get to know him a little better. Max, welcome to the Cards Chat Podcast. Thank you, and that was a beautiful introduction except for the fact that I expected to be in the first five of your podcasts instead of 128. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I mean, which, okay. Which, I well, forgive you because the introduction was so cool. You're one of the first five Italians we've had on the show. I can tell what? you probably. <laughs> I better be. <laughs> I think you're the first official Italian. We have to check, but I think you're the first. Uh, I mean, that is a very cool nickname, the Italian Pirate. And, you know, I've been to Italy, but I don't think there's many pirates in Italy. So where exactly did that nickname come from? It's one of the things that people don't know. They were real Italian pirates in the past. And okay. I had to research which one was the most famous. But uh, uh, I think it was um, Barbanera, Black hmm. Be- Beard, mm-hmm. was uh, his, which, by the way, was my... Uh, nickname on GG Poker when I started Max Blackbeard, uh, <laughs> but then I switched to my real name because of uh, uh-huh. you know twitching, doing Twitch and sure. So um, it came because of one of the first um, uh, tournament televised events that they were they were showing here in Vegas. Uh, one day I had my hair like crazy. I put like a bandana that was like uh, Italian flag. Mm-hmm. And I made a final table. So next day I say, I'm going to put it as a superstitious uh, thing. I'm going to put it again. I made a final table and say, wow, I'm going to start putting it. And so in the show, someone mentioned it. And uh, because bandana were associated a little bit with sure. with pirates. Eh? So I say, uh, and they huh. started doing that. And it just stuck. How about that? That's yeah. And, uh, you know, it was actually a very good marketing move because, then uh, I remember, like, because of that, I didn't even win anything yet. And yet I was in uh, the first Activision WSOP uh, video game. That's and if so you, cool. like, look at the back in 2005, uh, I didn't win an even bracelet yet. Yet there was my picture with Bandana because it was a character that right. it was cool to have in a video game. So For me sure. coming from video games, being in a video game with it, it was a perfect marketing move. It almost doesn't even matter what your nickname is. If you have a nickname, that means you're somebody. You know, it's like in the poker That's world. true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, you've had um, quite a lot of success, as we mentioned in the intro, uh, in your career, specifically at the World Series of Poker, those four wins and four separate poker variants. To me, and I think to a lot of players, that demonstrates that you're really a complete player, not just, you know, no limit hold'em. So I'm wondering, when you started playing poker originally, did you right away start playing all the different games or was it just hold them and then a little PLO and then like the next one and the next one? Well, I mean, my first real poker game was um, uh, the, 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 the ones that you see in the movies, five cards in mm-hmm. my hand with a strip deck. So only 32 cards. We used to play four-handed and I used to play in Italy that... That game, which it was by far the the most popular game, uh-huh. we had a version that was um, kind of a, a five card stud, where you start with one card uh, covered and one card up, right? And then you you bet. Then there is one card up, 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 up until five cards, right? So those maybe kind of open my mind to different kind of uh, games. Um, and then when I came to Vegas, I started playing seven card stud for a brief period of time. 
then when to limit holding because the pots were so much bigger and seven cards that they used to play but it used to be like really an old man game where yeah. people put like one dollar but you couldn't win because of the rake <laughs> and everything uh-huh. so like i kept watching and it was at the rio curiously was at the rio that i keep seeing these gigantic pots of people like betting crazy and they're like one guy told me that's the game that you should be in so i i like moved to that game and and um, start playing Limit Hold'em, and then so on. I mean, uh, from there, Limit Hold'em was my game. Then uh, kind of, I, I met one of the, uh, the first Italian poker player uh, that won a bracelet called Walter Farina, mm-hmm. and he won it in seven card studs. So by becoming friends, sometimes I sit behind him, watch him. So I play that game. Right. And then it was Omar High Low for a while at the Mirage. They used to play that. So right. I kind of like play a little bit everything. No Limit was a game that came way after okay. uh, that I was already professional. So right. people don't even remember. But in 99, which that's when I turned pros, or at least I left my job to try to become pro. Mm-hmm. And that year I kind of broke even. So I didn't even make money. And actually for a while. But um People don't remember No Limit did not exist in any poker room. It was only in tournaments, and that's it. There was right. no cash game, No Limit. Instead, now it's almost there is no limit all them cash game. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the opposite. I mean, there is some, but sure, uh, one out of 20 games, maybe. Sure. So just to sort of bridge the gap a little bit, you said, you know, first you came to America, you had a job, and then you turned pro. Yeah. So what were you like? What is it that brought you from Italy to America in the first place, and what job did you have? Well, I mean, uh, I came here as um, I, I used to write on a magazine, uh, uh, several magazines in Italy, uh, because there were all this platform uh, of computer was um, Amiga mm-hmm. was the I don't know if you remember uh, you um, it, it might you might be too young, uh, so. Um, Amiga was one of the computer. Uh, then there was, uh, um, you know, all the other ones that were like uh, a few of the other console games. Mm-hmm. But I was specialized in Amiga, which was uh, the most popular in Italy by far. Okay. And um, and and nothing. So I just test the video games, writing, and and then. Uh, what happened there was a ces convention here in vegas sure, and sure. the guy that was like above me said let's go you know we like poker you like poker you like gambling let's go and we do that we go to the company that was based here i forgot right now but uh, there was a big company software company came that was here uh-huh. and so we came had a meeting uh, and at the same time i like never went to the convention center i just stayed in the poker room and <laughs> the whole time so i didn't get fired because i was getting paid so little anyway but um but it was fun and uh, and that's you know then i say here kind of was a crazy move to to move here and wow yeah and um, and then and i said i loved gambling so much i said let me get the understanding I'm going to deal in school and understand all the games. So uh-huh. then I dealt for a little bit uh, casino games and um, and it was interesting. But then I would take early out right away, go play poker. And I soon saw that I was making more money playing poker than working. So I said, oh, let's just do that. Sure. And, you know, so, you, you clearly have some gamble in you to make moves like that in your life and to make those oh, decisions. For sure. What was it that made you say, okay, I believe I can turn pro and literally make a living at this game instead of just something that I enjoy and, you know, okay, once in a while I have a good session? So it was two two different points. One was like this girl that I was dating, she told me that the previous boyfriend was a professional gambler and I was saying, okay but i don't even understand what if he goes broke the concept of a professional gambler that goes broke i couldn't get through me i'm mm-hmm. saying what does he do you know if he goes to zero right which okay one you can get a job second if you're good enough there is people probably who will stake your lower uh, games and then you can build your way up so there is two different things that you could do 
And um, and second one was I was going to the horseshoe playing at night. Mm-hmm. So I would get off my job. I go to the horseshoe playing at night. And this is and the I, old horseshoe in downtown, oh, not the, uh, the one on the strip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old horseshoe downtown, dark, everybody smoked. Yeah. So, um, and uh, I would play a limit hold them at night. And, you know, one day, two, three, four, they, I kept racking. I mean, I kept cashing out racks mm. of one dollars. And one guy says, you know, you should be a professional. And I'm like, what's a professional? And uh, mm. still, I couldn't understand it. And say, oh, what are you working for? And so it kind of went to my mind. And then uh, slowly I started meeting like people uh, talking and then end up saying, okay, I want to leave my job. But at the same time, you know, I stayed in very good terms with the casino manager and say, mm-hmm. you know, hire me back if if I right just bad. in case. And he said, yeah, you're great workers. And so um, whenever you want to come back, I'll get your job. And and so, but it never happened. You right. know? Then I did get other jobs because by being a gambling expert, it's kind of easy to understand that people in the industry really don't know much. Mm. And so it's easy to get a consulting job because if you, someone understand how much you know, yeah, then uh, first they grow they grow you as a as an individual as a person that will actually uh, does do things in the in the company, but at the same time, you you become essential because uh-huh. yes, people go to university, they get a master, they get but at the end, if you leave Vegas, if you right. are a gambling addict, but with a with a brain, right. then you understand that there is so much that you know compared to actually people in very good position. And sure. so you are, it, it's a perfect combination because sure. I can have my freedom, but at the same time working and helping things that they cannot know because they don't live it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you started around like the late 90s and I looked at the Hendon mob, of course, you got to look at the Max's Hendon mob and I see that your first tournament cash was in Reno <laughs> yeah, in 2002. Funny. So before we get yes. to that specific cash, what were those, in, like, why did you not play any tournaments or just, I know that there weren't that many tournaments to play, uh, you know, it's not like today, but why, why were you sticking to cash games specifically? So to me, um, all I started playing cash. I didn't even really look at too much at tournaments. I mean, I, one of the things that I do remember is when um, um, I was watching the World Series every once in a while because they were doing in local news. And uh-huh. and uh, so, yes, there were some moments that I would look at that, but it wasn't something that, you know, there wasn't like too much. At the same time, I kept playing cash because it's kind of easier to make money in cash but it was also where i was just before i didn't even know what professional gambler is so slowly i went to cash game but Mm -hmm. they were not like every place a tournament but one day i remember i played with man the master Mm -hmm. and and i was like i'm so much better than him and he's like a legend (laughs) why am i not doing that and moving there so you know, I started and really, really playing online and things like that. And it happened like I used to play in this, uh, I don't remember if it was Ultimate Bat. Okay. I believe it was Ultimate Bat. And so um, kind of playing and those, there were qualifiers to go into places. I went to Aruba right. to play. Right, right, in, right. In fact, there is like one of the events. But also started meeting a few people that were playing tournaments. Uh, I meet Jennifer Harmon, they play tournaments. So we kind of talk about it a little bit and then say, okay, let me go to Reno, play some tournament, get a, some experience. And that's how I got into it. Interesting. And then it was interesting because then there were, you know, online poker affiliates. So it became like something that it was interesting. I think if I w- would have start three, four years earlier, I would have had a head start um, on many things. Yeah. But at the same time, I also start very early. So I sure. can't really complain of uh, what I did because, you know, but. Right. Um, well, when I, when I mentioned Reno in 2002, you had a smile on your face right away. So you remember this tournament <laughs> yeah. that you cashed in was a, a crazy pineapple high low. So how did you, how did <laughs> first, you end up in that First cash in my, 
<laughs> it was a one hundred dollar <laughs> buying <laughs> event. <laughs> yeah, it was a nighttime, and it's very funny. But that's you know my aptitude of playing in different games was <laughs> already showing on what I was catching. Right. Uh, yeah, just uh, you know, it was just they had all kinds of weird games, and and I played that one was the first time I cashed okay. and made a final table. But um, yeah, it's uh, I mean Reno was like really the first trip, and then when I came back there, I won like two tournaments in three days, yeah. and uh, and that was big because uh, of course uh, you know. Um, I realized later, but someone told me right away, you know, it's not going to happen very often to win right. two tournaments, so, you know, In a back row, to back. Also, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, back to back. So it's, um, it's very weird what happened. And, uh, and then I kind of got hooked up into tournaments and, you know, still play cash games, but at the same time, tournaments were interesting. Yeah. I don't know if I made the right move because cash games, they are, let's say if there was no sponsorships cash game is the way to go with sponsorship and everything it became clear that playing tournaments becoming a good name in the poker world was more interesting and um, and better at that right. point right well let's get back uh, a little bit sort of to those the, the moves that you decided to make i mean anyone who goes and moves halfway around the world that's not an easy decision even if it makes a lot of sense and what you know you're pursuing poker as a career but you've got family up until then. Everything you knew was back home in Italy. Was it sort of difficult to be far away? And, and how often do you sort of go back? You've been there for, what, 25 years almost, or maybe 30 years. Yeah, ago. yeah. I mean, I, oh, here now? Yeah, well, you've now, been to Las Vegas I, mean, for... I, I still go all the time. Okay. The first years I didn't go, but first of all, financially, it was difficult to to move and sure. uh, and also wasn't organized so i didn't really go much mm -hmm. but yeah after a while and then, uh, the last 10 years i've been many times uh, um, there i i was also lucky because italy was the first country that like kind of legalized poker and put set up rules mm -hmm. so you know i got a phone call i was a full tilt pro i got a phone call from italy and say hey, come here We'll pay a bunch of money and uh, nice. you know so i was like testimonial we did commercials i mean if you look at youtube there is a like, really some cool commercial that we did mm -hmm. uh, i went to so many shows in italy with like um, you know actually they became all famous after they interviewed me so you probably <laughs> i can probably see you on fox news soon and BBC. i don't know which one is uh <laughs> from your country in this really <laughs> well we see a lot of stuff that, that's for sure um okay so like you said you know it's uh clear which choice you had to make as far as tournaments or cash games as far as if you're pursuing money or fame but you know you're not like you like you said you know your your prowess in non-hold'em games and all of the games was evident very quickly um which is your favorite mixed game variant to play I'll, I mean, I like Raz and Stad High Low as my favorites uh, because I think it's kind of, uh, I, you know, I really feel comfortable. And I think people do not feel comfortable in those games. Hmm. So um, there are games that are fast. I don't really like to do slow games. So those are games that I really like. But in general, if I play cash game, I like to play 10 games, 15 games, 20 games. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of more fun for me. Got it. Um, okay. In tournaments, I have to say everything has an appeal because no limit, mm -hmm. even if I despise it in a cash game, has beautiful appeal in a, in a tournament because of the blinds going up, the, all the scenario of knocking right. out. There is so many variables. And even now with the mystery bounty, mm -hmm. even more, it adds to the equation. It's beautiful because, first of all, all the people that I really don't like oh no you have to raise 1.72 not 1. 1.7 come on <laughs> give me a break I mean just just crazy <laughs> no limit player it completely changed they cannot do this in a mystery bounty it completely changes the dynamics so right. it's kind of they put a variable which is beautiful which is an equalizer mm -hmm. um, and uh, also makes 
the gambling factor completely different. So mm-hmm. it's, I think it's a great invention. I think and hope will it's one of the best inventions that they had in an no limit. So bounty tournaments and mystery bounties are my favorites sure. uh, now. And uh, and of course, in War Series is different because there is all the mixed game. And it's beautiful. War Series, why, if you, since you asked me why I'm mm-hmm. successful at War Series, first of all, is because I love the variety. One day I play one team, one day I play another one team, I play another one. And the other thing is, um, People come to the World Series, even they don't play one game, they play because they're the World Series. So right. it's beautiful. The value, it's immense. Yes, for sure. That's a good way of putting it. Yes. It's great. Even if I lost a bunch of money this year because I lost like 65000 but because I play the higher limit. So, of course, if you play a $25,000 buy-in, you cash, you are up for the summer, right. you lose, you're down twenty five k. So those are change everything. But, but overall... Sure. That's why I love the World Series because they didn't, they never, even when No Limit was incredibly popular and, it, you know, Bellagio took out all the games that they were not No Limit and all the other ones kind of follow what Bellagio did. World Series never did. World Series kept to their task to say, we are the World Series, we're the World Championship, we have to have many games. Right. And that's what I loved about them, you know, and that's why I continue to kind of even play less tournaments, but World Series, I want to be there. Because right. Of well, we'll definitely ask some more uh, World Series questions. I've got uh, some of those up my sleeve for you, but I want to ask, you know, obviously the overwhelming majority of poker players, you know, if they know any game, it's probably Texas Hold'em. What sort of... um I don't know, tips or, or encouragement could you give someone who's never tried mixed games before to say, hey, you know, these could be fun. Like, you know, what what would be your encouraging words? Well, first of all, I would say buy Super System 2 and read it. Even if it's a book that came out, I, I don't know, 15 years ago, it's still a game, I mean, a book that tells you a lot of the games that they are in the mix, and they're all written by good or great players. Yeah. Some that they are good players, but great teachers. So mm-hmm. it's a perfect book to start. There is Tad High Law, right, by my friend Todd. Um, there is uh, Daniel wrote the Deuce 7 mm-hmm. uh, section. Uh, then there is... Um, Mark Gregory wrote the Omaha High Law, which is, was a regular in the Omaha High Law, even if he didn't sign it, someone else signed it. I, I don't remember who it was. Kind of like all the um, all the games are covered that they're not the crazy new games, but that's a really good book to start. Mm-hmm. And then uh, then see if you can play somewhere because uh, it depends on the sites that you play. And there is uh, many places that you can play mix. Sure. For sure, if someone approaches now and say, what should I play, poker? I would say Pot Limit Omaha. That's the game that you should play uh-huh. because it's more fun more fun for uh, uh, recreationals. In Europe, there is more Pot Limit Omaha games than No Limit. Yeah. There is no doubt about it. And uh, it, this trend will keep continue, will keep growing. Uh, will, you know, I believe No Limit for many reasons will kind of slow down, hmm. not in tournaments, but in cash game and pop limits for Omaha will keep going up. The game and in Vegas, it's not that way. Well, it's the game of the present. Of the Europe. present. Uh-huh. Uh, the game here, I don't know because, uh, but still, there, you know, it's a fun game. It's more fun for uh, someone who's a fish or a businessman or, <laughs> and it's more fun to play more combination, more you know, things. Okay. Well, let's go back to your, uh, you know, that, that trophy case that I mentioned uh, in the introduction. We'll go back 17 years. The first time you ever won a bracelet in 2006, you beat yeah. Mike Madison, uh to win the yeah. gold. At that point, you know, it's 2006. So you've been playing professionally for uh, seven, eight years, something like that, maybe a little longer, close to 10 years. What is Max Pescatore's life like in 2006? And how did it change if it changed in 2006 once you won the bracelet? It didn't change much. I didn't go out and buy like a 
I didn't go out by a house. I didn't go out by um, a crazy car. Uh, I didn't change much. I kind of kept to my task of being a professional and and uh, keep going in those dire- in that direction. Uh, mm-hmm. I had a uh, I had an um, internet website before there was even any rule. I had a like a skin in Italy uh-huh. that I that I started a year before and it was <laughs> stolen to me one week after that I wanted my bracelet by my best friend at the time. So, um, so it, it was just uh, weird, but I was mm. trying to move in the poker world. Uh, and uh, I, I saw like an opportunity in Italy that then changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was doing things to, over the only not only in the poker play but mm-hmm. in, in other things so i actually started car player italy um not much longer so i had it for eight nine years i had a website i had oh, I a magazine huh. yeah, yeah it was uh if you look at car player italy online you probably can find car player italia uh-huh. you probably can find all the covers that we had huh. <laughs> but it was it was fun but it was a lot of work and yeah it, it was just you know, not a, maybe a good investment, uh, but um, but at the same time, it kind of help helped me in different directions to sure. to move in the Italian market. So, Got yeah. It. And how about just sort of personally? Did it feel like you know some extra validation that you didn't have before? Maybe people give you a little more respect, or like you said, was it just? Well, you you knew that it was eventually coming. It was a matter of when. No, no, I didn't know. But there is a nice story about that, too, because Mm -hmm. um, when I started playing tournaments, my bank, my cash banker wasn't gigantic because I've always been someone that spent money. Like, I like spending money and going to good restaurants. So I kind of, like, leave the money that I made. Mm-hmm. So my banker wasn't huge. So my idea was, okay, let me find someone that will take me in tournaments. And um, so I was a little bit friend with Todd Bronson before. So I asked him, you know, do you want to take me? And he said, okay, at the time, you know. It... So he starts taking me in tournaments. And we had a deal, which was in his, all in his favor. But <laughs> um played. And uh, so I start going to tournaments and uh, play and Pretty much, he stayed me until uh, 2006 before the World Series. Okay. And he stayed me almost, um, you know, in in a lot of tournaments and uh, with makeup. Uh And I practically broke even for like three years, which was a damaging for my bankroll because I was playing less cash games. Sure. And then the World Series, he told me, oh, you know, there is Doyle's room and my you know, we're going to have 10 pros and uh-huh. I talked to my father and, you know, I, he wants to be sponsor you and, and also put you into the tournament. The World Series. And I said, of course. Yeah. So we finish our deal. You just play for those. Oh, or boy. The third <laughs> tournament that I play, I win 680,000. <laughs> That's very in sport. <laughs> With twenty five hundred dollar, <laughs> wow! And this, so it was like, oh. <laughs> so it was it was just funny that that happened. And I remember Doyle coming to uh, to the final table after I won to like uh-huh. shake my hand. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and wow. also take the money. <laughs> right, of course, right, of course. But wow, that's an interesting one. I, mean, I wasn't planning on answer, uh, asking this one till later, but since you had mentioned Todd and how you first met him and you know how you first uh, you know got connected with him, eventually uh, you went into business together and you're co-owners of Roma Deli. What made you decide to do that and to go into business together as partners and, and why the restaurant business? Um, if I invent a time machine, I will go back and not do that. Not really? because of Todd, but because of the other partner that we had before. We uh-huh. only had problems, and uh, so many people told me don't buy a restaurant. <laughs> I mm-hmm. shouldn't have. So we didn't do that. And now I'm a small partner, only with Todd. It's more for fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not for fun for him because he has the most uh, percentage. Uh-huh. But yeah, I mean, it's a way to. To stay connected as friends, uh, but you told me a 
something that you asked me a question that I didn't answer was, do people like give you more respect after that you win a tournament? Yeah. So it wasn't that. It's the fact that by winning it by Do- with the with Doyle's room uh-huh. and with Doyle, the thing is after you know like they will go. Let's say the World Series next year. Uh-huh. They will go to l- dinner break, and I would go to dinner break with Doyle and Chip and uh, and Todd. So, like, I'm there with like legends uh, to have dinner. Uh-huh. So of course, that would put me in the eyes of everybody else, right? On a different life by, because, by association. Yeah, <laughs> by association. Uh-huh. I won, and after I'm having dinner with with Chip and Doyle, and you know, and. They were always so nice and, and tall, of course. But mm-hmm. you know, so yes, that kind of changed the way they looked at me. But I was already um, Las Vegas professional, respected. Okay. So um, you know, now it's probably the new guys of Notre Dame. Nobody knows, but it's a different right. story. But uh, it's normal. Well, unfortunately, you know, we all know Doyle's no longer with us. But you know, so much um, talking about him. Is there any? fun stories or memorable stories you'd like to share of him? Well, I mean, I was proud of the fact that, of course, Doyle couldn't go around the World Series. If you see some videos of the World Series, they're all chasing him all the time to try to take a picture. And at one point, I think he could walk, no problem, but he would drive a scooter so he can, like, Zoom away from people. that way <laughs> because <laughs> because if not he would never reach a bathroom. Every you know a bathroom break it would take him like forty five minutes because they wouldn't you know picture up. Plus he of course in an environment like that is trying to be nice. But one thing that was made me proud is he would like zoom everywhere you see him. If he saw me, he would like break and start chatting with me. That's nice. And then That's people really would strange. come there. You know, but and it was cool because I don't want to bother him. Actually, I don't even remember if I have a picture with him. Wow! Because of no kidding. You know, I I didn't. You know, I kind of feel come. If someone is a friend that kind of like don't uh, do the. You know, right. And, and this uh, is before then, selfies were a big deal, right? So you right, it is before right. selfies were a big deal. But you know, through the years, and I mm-hmm. kept seeing him. But but that was like one thing, and it was funny, like. Zoom away, hmm. leave me alone. No, he wouldn't say leave me alone, but he's zooming away from people. But then he would like break. Wow, unbelievable! <laughs> and start talking. So in time, that made me feel better. But, sure. You know, good. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned, of course, uh, Chip Reese, the late Chip Reese. You know, I I can't help but also ask, what stories about Chip uh, can you share with us? I don't have much except for the fact that he always had a smile. Mm. And he was always extremely courteous with me, even if I was just a young kid uh, mm. trying to keep okay, on. Not really a kid, but kid compared to sure. him because mm. I was 20 plus year difference, I mm-hmm. think, approximately. But he was extremely nice to me, you know, and, and when the few times that, you know, we, we had dinner or chat with him after. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, I don't remember specific things except for that, but that was actually good because you know it was considered the, 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 the one of the best players in the world at that sure. point, and also uh, legendary, you know, in many ways. So, mm-hmm. cool. you no know, people don't remember, but uh... So that, um, you know, after Chip passed, they actually changed the, um, the, the, the 50K, which was the mixed game tournament that everybody wanted to win into his name. So, sure. I mean, that's trophy, the legacy right. that he had. So right. That was how important and, and well respected he was in the poker community. For sure. Um, okay, and back to Max's success. Uh, we talked about bracelet number one. Two years later, you win bracelet number two, and that's in Pot Limit Omaha. This is 2008. So you talked about, I guess, to a degree, the difference that winning bracelet number one made. How about number two? Did that make, did that feel better because it was, I don't know, in PLO, or did it feel different in any way? 
It felt, I mean, the first one was such an explosion of joy that was, you know, I, I can probably never uh, feel again. Although I felt it similar to the fourth bracelet that I won. Mm-hmm. You know, but the second one was more, okay, that means I'm good. Because one, anybody can win one. But winning two, it's already like it's not a percentage a of right. people that win two, then you're like much lower. Okay, maybe I'm good. And so, yeah, that's how I felt. And also mm-hmm. because of the uh, how I dominated the table, I really, really was one of those days that I I was like in the zone that probably had the players that they were not. Um, maybe a good matchup, but it was completely domination. So... I mean, I remember even when I went all in, I was what ninety percent in Omaha, wow. and so it was just not only I kept winning the chips, and it right. was half pot limit Omaha, half, half pot limit Hold'em that tournament. Ah, okay. But I completely Sorry. dominated the Omaha because everybody played Hold'em, and I felt like in Omaha they didn't know as much as you know I did the game. So right. that was the good, good thing, and I remember I had. There was this bar, so the table was like here, and then there was this bar that was like very high, and mm-hmm. there was like a bunch of people that could stay on top, and there were all my friends staying on top, and well, since Formula One is coming to Vegas, uh-huh. do you <laughs> do you like ever watch Formula One when the car arrives and everybody's like leaning over? With yeah, sure, yeah, of course. <laughs> felt that way. I went like indicated them, and, and they were all like. Ah! <laughs> exactly like a Formula One uh, finish. That's um, cool. So it was very cool. And, and of course, everyone has, every bracelet has a moment. Yeah. And that one was my my personal moment. I remember the friends like Beautiful. <laughs> cheering me. Beautiful. Well, Max, you know, uh, in poker, it's important to change gears. So we'll change gears just a little <laughs> and ask you okay. something a, a little away from poker, more on the personal side. Uh, you and I, we had a chance to play together a few months ago, uh, and I remember you showed me a picture of some artwork that you were either, I don't remember if you bought it or you were thinking of buying it. You know, what exactly does art mean to you? Do you enjoy going to museums and, you know, seeing sculptures, music? Look, what What is uh, art's role in your life? Well, let's start who I despise. Those crazy people that go and glue their hands into, <laughs> you know, a Monet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no matter what, respect what people have done in life. Mm. You know, art is art and you have to respect it. So, no, I don't like, there is a, there is some art that I don't like, but there is, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. And so, I mean, Coming from Italy, there is, of course, so many museums, so many great, you know, legendary. I mean, we talk about legend in poker, but we have like you know, <laughs> people that have done so much in the, in the art uh, world. And I mean, my favorite might be Giotto, hmm. which I don't know if you know him uh, or not. not familiar. Well, Giotto was famous because the legend said that when he went to an they were they were paint they they were i don't know if the paint is the right word but um let's say there was an audition to who will uh paint the inside of uh florence and mm-hmm. uh, okay. the, the the duomo of florence and all these painters came and like show their beautiful art and giotto the legend said that giotto went there and uh, we just, uh, um, a, not a paper, but uh, okay, the, something that- The, the canvas? To draw a canvas. Yeah. Yes, sorry, my- Sure, English. it's fine. <laughs> a canvas, and uh, he just uh, took uh, a brush and painted um, a circular um, perfect ring. Sure, okay, wow. So- by bare hands, he just painted a circular ring. They looked at it, and it was perfect. And uh-huh. they say, "Okay, if he can do that, then okay, you got the job." Interesting. And that's a okay. famous of uh, Giotto, which was my 
also one of my first pet. I called him John. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Italy, we, we study, we, we have a lot of uh, things that, you know, we, we go to museum with. It's one of the big art um, country in the world. Sure. So, of course, you know, I have a few paintings that I like. I actually just posted one on Instagram that I bought in Reno 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so by a local painter but yeah i do like it and uh, i see you have an artwork in the back of uh of well that's that's <laughs> that's my daughter here i'll show everyone that's on. okay that's my daughter made that she's my artist she's very good <laughs> so you're obligated to put it in of course i got I, you know what i don't <laughs> normally do this but I'll, since you asked here's another work from my daughter over there ah there you go <laughs> yeah she's very talented she's cool. 15 years old you know. <laughs> ah, cool, cool. Yeah, nice. yeah so um, yeah, in general, of course, being Italian, I have to like uh, painting. And I don't remember which one I showed you. It might have been one uh, from... It, uh, it was black and white, I remember specifically. There was like a, a lot of lines, like swirls, sort of. I don't know how to explain it. I'm not uh, well versed. Uh, yeah, in I don't remember. I don't remember which one it was or which conversation we were having. So, uh -huh. But okay. it could be that I maybe just came across and say, wow. <laughs> it, so, it was, but it struck me. I was like, oh, interesting. I have to ask about that. Um, well, you mentioned uh, Instagram. I want to ask about a different social media platform of yours, Twitter. Uh, there's a specific yeah. tweet from just a little while back that I wanted to highlight. You had some major praise for a WSOP dealer. You said, this is Tracy. And she's like, oh, she's the, yeah. She's the perfect dealer, the perfect thing you could possibly say. And it was just unbelievable. And obviously this kind of went like mini viral and retweets and likes and something. Unbelievable, yeah. In an age when so many people, so many players, both their recreational players, professional players, usually they use Twitter to complain. But you used your platform for genuine positivity. So, so where does that come from? Okay. I don't know. I mean, uh, I, Twitter is definitely the platform that I like the most since Elon Musk took over. There is nothing that I like better than Twitter because you can post whatever you want. It's free and everything without going into politics. Sure. There is no, unless you're threatening someone, you can post your point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, I mean, I'm always, because of the years that I spent in Italy, and I was sponsored by a company that we also organized live uh, events. We mm -hmm. used to be called the Poker Grand Prix. So when I go there, I actually never had success in that tournament uh, format. And one of the reasons is I try to be a perfectionist and tell the dealers, no, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do that. In fact, my girlfriend, which is my uh, girlfriend from Italy that um, is um, used to deal, she used to tell me that I'm the terror of the dealers. Because <laughs> what, first of all, I was very important in the company because I was the face of the company and, you know, and people love me and all the management, but also mm -hmm. because I would like, if something happened, I would like really get upset without disrespect. But, you know, Unfortunately, I dealt before, now poker, but, and I know that there is a style. In Italy, croupier, which is dealer, always had an amazing style. You go and they had like a way of taking the chips. It's, like it's always been an like, artist with the, with the cards. Exactly. Yeah, it's very exactly. interesting. Yeah. So why becoming sloppy as a dealer? Why, why dealing and hate everybody? Because a lot of dealers hate the players, but it's if you instead you have a positive attitude, and it's easy for me to say, but no, it's not. You know, I would do the same in any job. Mm -hmm. I would try to do my best in any job. And unfortunately, one of the things that I learned a long time ago is that in Vegas, for example, when you apply as a dealer, if you have too much experience, they don't want you. Why? Because a lot of dealers become sloppy. Mm -hmm. They start doing things what they want instead of what they are taught. Right. So I wrote something. And if you look, it might have not been, you, you might have missed the other one. 
Okay. I was playing the main event, and uh, at one point, there is a big pot. And this dealer was with the right hand having the deck. Right. Or maybe it was the left hand having the deck. Yeah, left hand went in the deck. And with the right hand had the muck, and he was spreading the muck, and then picked it up. Then spreading it, then picked it up. So I took Ooh. a video of that, mm. put it on the internet, and say, please, WSOP, tell dealers not to do this. Right. Because I've seen many dealers doing that. They play with the Mac, which is something that they're not supposed to. They can expose a card. Sure. I mean, can you imagine the guys thinking to call because he thinks the other guy has a king, and we're playing with, you know, potentially twenty, thirty, fifty thousand sure. dollars life changing money. money. And he shows the king, and then a guy calls. Yeah. So I brought that, and I did the video by just zooming on his hand uh-huh. without showing who he was because I didn't want to shame the right. dealer. I was just, a, I got so many insults because of that. Oh. And I was, and a lot of people also like, you know, took my my sides. But uh-huh. I was like, why? Why am I getting insult? I didn't like do anything, and I tried to answer, but people just extremely mean mm-hmm. so a few days later mm. i was in a better state of mind and, and i see this dealer and the dealers that i love the most are the one that you don't even realize they're there mm. it's always been like that yeah in a tournament you know in a cash game it might be a little bit different because there is a little bit of entertainment but in a tournament you don't need to know that is there right and she was just i watched everything that she does and she was just perfect. And, you know, a guy screamed at her. She looked with no hostility and mm. said, no, you know, this is the right way. And he said, mm. oh, okay, you're right. Wow. So there's no reason to fight. And mm-hmm. and uh, and so it was crazy how viral it went. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I was happy for her because then I showed it to her. Right. And she was like, you that know, was beautiful. very embarrassed. But, uh, but, yeah, I mean, we why not put in things Twitter, you know, the right. thing that I like most is do a, um, a random uh, act of kindness to sure. like a stranger. That's a good thing. You know, holding the door and doing things. those are things in our society. They will improve. if everybody done today, someone else might do another one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for sure, you know, That's- yes, it was beautiful that it went so viral, and I didn't expect almost a thousand likes, which is crazy. <laughs> Well, that's a beautiful you know, thing. And, and I don't get a thousand likes if I win a bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Uh-huh. It's it's always good to showcase uh, you know genuine positive things. Uh, and speaking yeah, of that, and I'm someone that sometimes fights with dealers. You know, I had one guy that was crazy against me this year. I had the whole table. I had to go to the floor and say the, the right. dealer is way out of line. Right. And uh, you know, I just. Yeah, you know, sure. happens. Things happen, but it finishes there. You know, of even course. if you have a discussion, next time you see, okay, hi. It's kind of like a referee, you know. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, you shouldn't like hold grudges. Right. So on on the more positive side, also, you know, this is we call ourselves the friendliest poker podcast in town. Can you name perhaps the friendliest player you've ever played against at the felt? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. That's a very tough question. <laughs> I don't know because I don't see many players have been bad or anything. I mean, um, some, some, uh, you know, some players are not good, you know, in a way with dealers and everything. But at the same time, a, a player needs to be friendly. If he's a professional, you need to be friendly mm-hmm. because it's part of the it's part of your job if you have a hostile environment or not talking to here we go there is the, the perfect concept why i think no limit is going to always slow down okay. because all the internet players that became so good they're also the ones that hold headphones don't mm-hmm. talk to anybody as soon as the two uh, players businessmen get up they don't even play one more hand. They yeah, just set out. Yeah. You know, that's just crazy. Instead, you have to entertain. You have to. Uh, that's what a mixed game is always been. You know, if someone is a doctor, is a lawyer, and he comes there 
because uh, he finished uh, working and he wanted to spend four hours. Doesn't matter. He might be twice as smart as you, not in poker, but give him respect. Don't make right. fun of him because he makes a bad check race. It's insane. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, okay, if they come at Roma Deli, someone orders, um, well, I'm going to have the the lobster. And I'll be like, you know how much we charge? How much we spend for a lobster to make? Wow, you're a fish. <laughs> That's so stupid. No, why would you do that? To, uh, you know, if the guy wants a lobster and pay three times as much as what is our food cost, let him have that and actually be extra nice to him. That's a In great example. Sometimes people forget. I love that. That's a great example. Wonderful. <laughs> Well said. Um, so just want to get another couple questions from you before we uh, end this one off. Um, you know, Max, we talked, you've been playing for quite a long time, over two decades. You've seen the initial poker boom. You've seen things scale back. And now you've seen this resurgence again, you know, over 10,000 people in the main event, poker rooms packed everywhere throughout the summer. In yeah. what way does what's going on now feel similar to that those boom years? And in what way does it feel different? Well, the difference is that internet poker, it's less of a play compared to what it was before. Mm-hmm. So I think the boom was, this when they had the real boom was because of internet poker. I mean, everybody says money maker. I disagree with that. That was TV and combined with online poker, then Mm -hmm. sponsorship and all that. Yeah, that was a turning point, but it's nothing to do with, uh, you know, of what happened. Uh, Now it's a little bit different. There is a boom and I don't even get why, but the reason is just people love to play and love the competition. So, and I think overall World Series has done a tremendous job. Um, to mention others, stars for the last six, seven years was horrendous uh, online. And uh, now they finally seem to understand that you can't just take all your poker players and drag them to the casino business. You have to cultivate both. And this is what happened when a company hires people that, as we said at the beginning, they are extremely good and, success- and successful in the business world, in company, right. but they don't know the basics of uh, of gambling. And so they say, oh, casino is where we make the money. Let's put them all there. Mm-hmm. Forget about poker players. And they lost a gigantic amount of, uh, of players. Now they're doing something better, you know. Yeah. Um, so they're, and actually I'm going to be at EPT Barcelona for the first time in 10 years. Wow, and nice. uh, so I'm excited to go there and, and see and give them a little bit of a chance. And uh, hopefully they'll they'll move. And all this is also because there is another great player, which is JG Poker, which changed again the online world because right. they, are, they are the full tilt of 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Hmm. They are so good from everything that they do. And so now they're going to enter... Um, I mean, there is already like some sponsor, like uh, and maybe they will enter more the the live tournaments with sponsorship and everything. Right. So, you know, this well, competition, excitement probably competition comes... is definitely a good thing. Oh the yeah, That's when sure. stars bought full tilt software, that was like a dark moment in uh, <laughs> in you know, and and they actually ran into the ground. Hmm. It was terrible when they bought it. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the future of poker is bright and uh, hopefully we'll stay out of all the AI bullshit, which I hate. <laughs> and um, and we'll go on. And uh, and that's why it's good to have a mystery bounty or uh-huh. bounties or things different. Right. Because it doesn't become um, a chess game. I sure. mean, can you imagine if a chess was mystery chess bounty? Okay, there you go. I got the idea for you. You know, okay. Depends I take a which pawn. pawn you take. Yes. Yeah, I take a pawn, but under there is a five. Okay, that's worth more than, well, like the rook. <laughs> so now who's going to win? You know, I'm a five. You took a rook. We are five and five. Nice. <laughs> so, Very cool. 
Uh, so two more for you, Max. Uh, you went from two bracelets to four, winning two in the summer of 2015. This yeah. past summer, Josh Arye went from four to six. So it seems like, you know, if you look at trends, you look at poker long enough over the years, a lot of po poker pros either do or don't have momentum from time to time. So I'm wondering from your experience and obviously your extensive knowledge of the game, how much of tournament poker success boils down to variance and volume and how much is all about you improving your game and, you know, getting the edge on your opponents? I mean, both a combination of everything. Uh, the fact that someone is able to win two in a row, uh, I saw a guy that I didn't know. I don't actually remember his name. They won two tournaments this year, two mixed tournaments. He was at my table. Oh, Chad, Chad Evesled, the dealer's choice. Yeah, he won two tournaments. He mm -hmm. was at my table, I believe, in the fourth, 3,000. I was looking at him like, the hell is he doing? And really, like, <laughs> he must have made, I don't know, 10 plays that I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Just completely. But the point is, he's overconfident, he's over aggressive, which is perfect for tournaments. And so he will push every edge. Uh, so he would he was playing exploit poker yeah into mixed games huh. and you know that's how he gets big stack uh, and then explode into a victor hmm. because then he becomes like uh you know uh, very difficult to play in many decisions sure. many points uh, and that's what he was doing and uh so josh has always been different i i felt always josh which he was he was at my table the first, I believe he won the bracelet on my first WSOP um, final table that I ever made, mm. which was a public Minoma tournament. I remember he, I believe he won the tournament and there was Eric Seidel in the, in, in the table. There was mm. him. Um, and, and I remember that's the first time I saw Josh. But right. I always saw Josh as someone... Uh, which has an overall game, mm -hmm. which is not crazy, not just more mathematical right. thinking, just closer to my game now, not then because I was just, you know, a beginner. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm happy for Josh, which I've been using his site this year, Poker Stake. Yeah. For putting putting uh, up uh, some of my things is work mm -hmm. well. They are associated with GG, so it's perfect. And it brings and, more uh, money into the poker ecology. It's good. It gives everyone a rooting interest. It's a very good thing to have. Poker yeah, it's now. absolutely. I mean, I always thought years ago. I said when I was at the horseshoe, still I said, why don't <laughs> the horseshoe put up? I mean, can you imagine if you go to the World Series? I want to play a tournament. I post the 10,000 days before mm -hmm. and then say, I'm selling at 120. And then at the sports book, you can just go to the sports book and say, right. okay, instead of, okay, let me pick 1% of him. Uh, and you go to the sports book window, betting window. You right. bet on the players. Right. That would be perfect. They yeah. have many more players and, uh, and that would be a, a great way to improve the pool in sure. a tremendous sure. way. They can also, hold directly the money when you win sure there is no problems of uh you know no I, you won 57 percent of the price pool all for tax purposes is all perfect whoever wins as the t tickets mm -hmm. it would be uh, so he's doing that with a site he's not the first one that came out but it's very good software so i like it and to go back to streaks yes um i believe that Winning makes you win more. When you're doing bad, you your mind keep telling, mm. oh my God, I'm so unlucky and things like that. So that's why it's very hard for people that go bad, 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 and then they have no bankroll to go back up because of the confidence. And that's mm. why if you look at the first 50 top players in the world uh, as money made, the money that they made, 
they're probably all narcissists and think that they are the best players in the world. <laughs> but that's because you have to kind of in our business think that way because mm. if not, it's too depressing if you play tournaments. Right. So. <laughs> And uh, my last one for you is, uh, Max, and obviously the game has changed so much, you know, since you started playing. And yet, you know, you've remained a successful pro. You're 52 and you're destined to stand the test of time in poker. Have you given any thought to what you would like your legacy in poker to be? And perhaps even beyond poker, what would you like for that to be? I mean, uh... In in Vegas, I'm known, but, you know, I, I was uh, nominated. I had the chance to be nominated in, to go in the Hall of Fame, but that's never going to happen probably again. I might get a chance again because of popularity, especially in Italy. But, I mean, I can tell you I'm very proud of what the work that we, we've done in Italy to grow the game. Mm -hmm. There is so much poker. And, you know, if I go in a taxi in Italy – often taxi driver know who I am because of cool. advertisement. Yeah. And, and the, for how many things we've done to promote the game. I mean, in Italy, uh, Disney call me up a local Disney. They call me up to, uh, did a video of star Wars. Mm -hmm. They, because Star Wars wow. had in solo, I don't know if you remember the, if you watch it, you're yeah, sure, Hansel, yeah. Okay, right. In Solo, there is um, a game that they play Sabak. Okay. So at oh, one point, think, yeah, they tell okay. the story about how he lost uh, I remember this, you right. know, the ship. And so there is, you know, we did commercials with me, with all the aliens, and we, where I explained Sabak in Italian. That and it was so pretty cool. cool. If, you, if you see it on wow. Instagram, we still have it. Wow. So the thing is, we did so many things to improve the game that become that I'm proud that mm. people understand the game, but we also did it in a way to say, hey, you know, don't just gamble, try to make a little bit of money. I always told people be a semi-professional, keep a job and make extra money with poker. Don't just be a professional. That will come if you are a monster, mm -hmm. but that cannot, that's not for everybody. It's one out of 500, maybe poker player that approaches the game. Right. So, you know, and my legacy in Italy, it's always going to be important because of that, because of being uh, so popular in the poker world. Let's see what the Cards Chat community wants to ask you. Uh, Kun Aguero Cruz uh, has this question for you, Max, and says, you have four WSOP bracelets in four different variants. Which of, of those four variants do you believe is your best game? Well, first of all, I want to say hi to Kun Aguero, which he was this year at the World Series. Um, and uh, he showed the bracelet uh, of the main event uh, and did an interview. So that was pretty cool that he came to, oh, you know to World is. Series of Poker now <laughs> that he's cool. retired. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, I mean, realistically, I believe Raz is my best game because I believe the day the majority of people don't play correctly. Mm -hmm. And I actually, when I won my bracelet in fifth place, was fifth or sixth, was Elliot Extra. And uh, I remember when he was eliminated, of course, as respect that I have for him, I shake his hand and I say, he's the only one that can beat me. Uh. And uh, <laughs> so I was very happy, sad for him, but very happy that he was eliminated uh -huh. because it's, it's a game that, then, of course, I mean, No Limit is probably my worst game, even if I, you know, have uh, even won, like, four tournaments in Italy. And, but but I don't study it. I don't I don't play it as much. And, um, I, you know, it's just all the other ones are, are better. All three of them, I actually feel confident. Mm -hmm. I mean, Polyminoma in a tournament, I think it's a different kind of animal compared to cash game. Mm -hmm. So I like it. I used to play on full tilt. Um, they they used to have a thirty big blind cap, thirty mm -hmm. or forty big blind cap games. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And when you learn that, that's perfect translating a tournament because most of the time you don't have five hundred blinds. You right, have thirty, of course. forty. So my game is good in that situation. Cool. Uh, 
um, and uh, oh, Stad I love, of course, it was great. I mean, uh, uh, when I won the bracelet, I won it against Daniel, the Finnish, Daniel Negrano, the finished third, Stephen Chidwick finished second. So, mm-hmm. how can I not think I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm great at that game when I beat those two guys? Cool, so. very cool. Uh, Chainis. 420 has a question for you a little bit more of a a strategy question um wants to know max when i'm on the bubble phase of a tournament when should i pick my spots to try and increase my stack in order to last until like make it through the bubble okay so I didn't understand when you are already in the bubble phase so or meaning it's the, the bubble is approaching and he wants to make it into the money at what point do does he take his chances in order to make it, you know, for, for sure that he can make it into the money? So I believe everything changes depending on your stack. When you are, let's say, let's say that they're paying 15% and you're 20% away. Mm-hmm. Everything changes at that point. You have to understand if your stack has enough chips to dominate, mm-hmm. so you might be the one picking on the other players. Uh or it might be a medium stack. So if you're a medium stack, you don't want to make mistakes. Right. Because if you make mistake and you go lower, then you might have not enough chips to be aggressive and not enough chip to waste. So then if you're small, then it becomes a trouble, but it's also easier. Pick your right spot right. to try to not even double up, just to chip up to go up enough to 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 show the bubble. Mm-hmm. Who to attack? It's easy. I mean, uh, it's easy, but it's tricky. Mm-hmm. The players that they never fold, then, okay, you can never fold yourself. If you get two tens against a player that raises all the time, two nines, that's the perfect moment to move in against it. Right. And ace-king is trickier, but, of course, you're obligated. Ace-queen, ace-jack are different. Now, if we're talking to hold them, in part limiloma, even worse, it's different right. even more. Uh, I like limping a lot when I have a middle stack in part limiloma hmm. because nobody can isolate you. And even if they do isolate you, you have enough blinds to do whatever you want later. Sure. So it really depends on your game, your confidence, the players, etc. But let's say you have... Uh, 12 blinds and the big blind is an extremely tight uh, 99-year-old uh, poker player, well, maybe move in against him. Yeah. You know, that's a good spot <laughs> because probably he will not call unless he has a really good head. Good good advice there. Uh, here's one from Nasty Bent Gorilla uh, wants to know, do you have a favorite card game which is not related to poker? Any other card game that you play? Oh, uh, that's a good question. So in Italy, we play, um, which I haven't played in a long time, but we play Scopa or Scopone, which is a game. It's kind of a complicated game, but one of the games is you play couples okay. and you play with a deck of 40 cards. So there is no... Uh, 10, 9, 8. Mm-hmm. So it's ace through 7 and then pitchers. Um, so um, and it's it's a game where there is a lot of strategy of what you have. The mm-hmm. ace, it's like a joker. You scoop every card that there is in the middle. So you put down the card and then you, you play that. Mm-hmm. You know, recently Buraco was kind of fun because uh, I don't know if it's even known. Burraco is a I'm, game. I'm not familiar with that, no. Very popular game in Italy. And uh-huh. uh, they have all kinds of Burraco websites hmm. where you can play for money. So that was like a game that I played for a bit. But hmm. I guess Scopa is the one that uh, kind of my youth. We play that. Uh, I went to Catholic school, so we play that with, uh, with you know, priests will play with us. So. <laughs> it was, you know, and and parents would come and play. So it was my cool. first trophy was in Scopa. Me and my father against another, you know, dad and son. And I was seven year old. We finished. Nice. Seven. Very so. cool. Very <laughs> cool. Um, here's one from Goggleheimer's, a name I've never seen before. Thanks for submitting this question. Uh, Max, how much time, sorry, how much study time 
do you invest to progress in poker? How much study time? Close to zero. Really? Um, wow. I don't uh, spend any time progressing. I'm someone that if I was a football player, I do not want to train. I just want to go on the field and play every day. Mm -hmm. But I do not want to train. It's a bad thing for me. For sure, I could improve. But I do all kinds of other things. I just don't have uh, the will of time. If I'm not playing, I don't want to mm. think about the game. Because anyway, when you play, it's kind of a training. Because you watch the players that they're good. You watch the moves. Sometimes you talk about them. So, you know, I I have like times where I have to take out poker from my head. And uh, and so I try a little bit to look at GTO, but it was just not for me. And mm -hmm. uh, um, just, I, I rather just play and train. Interesting. I think that's in, very eye-opening. It's a very eye-opening answer because it just goes to show, folks, you can be plenty successful even without studying if you've got good well, game. And well, but I did well. study before. It's uh, fair. It's not like, I mean, it, when... As I said it in uh, the other interview, the previous interview, you know, there is some books that you need to read and do sure, well. I mean, they, they, they will help you to do well. But at the same time, you know, yeah, I watch Twitch every once in a while. I mm -hmm. guess there is some Twitchers that I might watch them a little bit. Okay. But um, that's about it. I try actually to Twitch for a while. But I couldn't get the numbers the way I wanted, so mm -hmm. I say, I'll, let's forget it." And uh, that was interesting because actually that will that will help because when you twitch, there is people that say, "Why didn't you do that?" Why? Well, I think that would be better. They actually help you improve too. Yeah, for so, sure. So, so like that's a way that people might, you know, adv that I would advise for someone to do right it doesn't have to always be memorizing charts or something there's different no, ways no, to no, study yeah. for sure and by the way charts they're different i know that now they're starting with chart, charts and public you know my, but i play mist, mostly games they don't have a rads doogie chart yet <laughs> thank <So>. god <laughs> a rads doogie chart oh god no yeah no, gto rads doogie oh man it's tough enough as it is um so Zoro two 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 Zoro two 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 has an interesting question. Where is your favorite place to play poker? I mean, in Las Vegas, that's what I like to play. It depends on where my game is. Um, it used to be Mirage, then it moved to Bellagio, then we moved to the Win. I mean, Bellagio was for so many years my office to go to play every day, mm -hmm. every evening, every night. So then it kind of changed. Now there is a different uh, game. Now we're playing a resort world. Um, so I kind of like, I kind of had to follow the games that I like. Okay. But, uh, in Vegas in general is my place to play. Yet I went to Europe many times and played in uh, France, London. And, you know, and that's that's also places that I like. Um, mm -hmm. Victoria of London used to be a place that I oh, spent a nice. summer and, and then go on the Vic. Cool. And it was a place that I like to go on. So. Good, good choices. Um, Acid Burn FX has one. Oh, I like this one. I mean, I like all of them. Uh, which poker rule would you change if it was up to you and why? <laughs> it's a good one. Okay, <laughs> it's a good one, and I guess I I will have to think about it for a long time. Um, of course, if it was possible, but it's not possible. I would, I would probably put a clock in every game, hmm. ever at least in no limit, wow. because one of the biggest things that people hate the most. It's having the clock, not having a clock, so someone can think about it forever. Mm. I mean, uh, recently I saw a tweet, I don't remember of who, but there was this professional that went, he was playing like a really high limit too. So mm -hmm. he's thinking, they call the clock on him, he check raise. Now, already I think that's a rule that we can talk about. We see, 
while I talk, sure. your rules will come sure. out. Sure. First of all, I try to, I suggest that. I say, if someone call a clock on you, you should never be able to check raise. Mm. Now, count that I come from a game which you have to raise immediately or you can only call. Okay. So think about it. If you have three minutes to think about it, why do you have to raise now? You yeah. can either call. It's okay. You it can't doesn't make much sense. Yeah. No. <laughs> and this guy, what he did was three minutes, they call a clock on him. He check raise. The guy call. Then he check. The guy bet again. And they went on time three minutes. And then he check raise again. Again, twice. Uh, wow. and, and they're like, okay, so now you're doing it on purpose. So how can you think that a professional or non-professional has the time to, or specifically will do, wait that you call the clock to then check raise you? It's, uh, it's something extremely bad. So I come from a game and we talked about it in the other um, interview where draw game, you're not, you can either you raise right away or you cannot raise. Even in Spain, they used to have this game that I used to play at Casino Barcelona called mm -hmm. Poker Sintetico. Same mm -hmm. thing. You have to raise immediately or you cannot raise. Right. Talking about five seconds, 10 seconds maximum. But then if not, someone can say, no, you waited too much and they rule that you cannot raise. Hmm. So the same thing. If there is a rule change that they should have is someone calls a clock on you, you cannot raise anymore. Right. Of course, optimal, if you cannot change a rule, having a clock in every game. So with the dealer touches and then you have 30 seconds. And, but it's hard to do that when you have 6,000 people in a tournament. Of course, of so, course. So it's very difficult. It's very good, different training for dealers. So I would put up that rule. And I think we'll, there is no drawback on that rule because there is no excuses for someone to wait for you that you call a clock and then check crazy. Right. If you and saw something, well, too bad. You should have seen it earlier. Right, and it affects a all everybody. players equally. It's not against one specific player. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. Cool. Uh, we've got three more people who sent in questions. Burma Joga, thank you very much for sending this in. Uh, wants to know, Max, what do you like to do to get your mind away from poker? Um, I mean, I like gambling in general so i always I, for a while i had a stable in italy with like almost 10 horses and that's where i spent all the money of the first two bracelets <laughs> uh, so i had to win more to to get <laughs> to break even with those uh i like this game mm. uh it's a fantasy nft game so okay. because i love watching football and i love sports in general uh this game, which is called So Rare. Oh, the, allows... the shirt that you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, the shirt that I wear, uh -huh. that I wore this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy came out with a concept. This French company came out with a concept of that you buy an NFT and the NFT is licensed by a football company. Uh -huh. So you buy an NFT of a player. And then once you own the NFT, you play tournaments for free where they put up money. Uh, money mm -hmm. uh, in uh, crypto or mm -hmm. other NFTs. So I've always been kind of against NFTs in general because to me, unless you buy uh, something extremely important of an art that become a unique NFT, mm. it's very hard to put a price on anybody that has monkeys to dif with different colors what are you going to do with it? I mean, I understand the concept of being in a club, maybe. Mm -hmm. so, but, but you know, very few have a value. I like right. the ones that have a value where you play. Coming from video games, to me, if uh, EA Sports will come up that you buy an NFT and then you can play it in the game, then it's good. Right. right. So this company did that. And then you buy these NFTs. And it's a lot, a lot of strategy like how to play them, they perform, you can buy them, sell them and things like that. So that takes a lot of time and a lot of time off my poker game. So yeah. I watch games and, and also when I'm bored, I do that while I'm in a poker game, which is not, not optimal <laughs> because I don't look at other players, but at least 
my gambling part doesn't come out. I want to play every hand. <laughs> so I can just <laughs> sit tight with my stack and do something else. That's balancing your attention ranges. That's so that's very good. <laughs> okay. So we've got Chica Bonita wants to know who do you consider your poker idol? Okay, first of all, give me the phone number of Chica Bonita and um <laughs> <laughs> just in case she has other questions <laughs> so my poker idol i mean it's hard to name one in general it's very hard to to point out one person in, but there have been favorite players that they kind of changed through my career um i can tell you uh since he's from my, your country, Elia Lestra to me has the most interesting game of the last few years. Hmm. Um, there was a big deal when me and him got nominated uh, the same year into the Hall of Fame and we were had the chance to enter in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And I remember that Daniel talked so bad about him and me um, in a way that and and we kind of became friends then because it was absurd. First of all, I knew how good he was. And so, I mean, there was different reasons, whatever. Uh, but, you know, I really liked the way he plays. So I can't say he's my idol, but I extremely, I respect extremely his game. Mm -hmm. I think he's a monster in many ways. Uh, then there is other ones like of my country, although he's Australian, but is also, you know, it, Italian origins. Jeffrey Lissandro, which yeah. never gets named in the Poker Hall of Fame, but it's crazy. He has six uh, bracelets. Yeah. In one summer, he won Stad Hilo, Raz, and Stad at the same time. The Stad sweep, and I remember that. <laughs> it was crazy. And uh, really, he has a very interesting game. I spoke to him this summer. He's not as... Uh, as at the top of the game that where it was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But, you know, things happen in life. And so, you know, you might not be at the top. You might go back to the top. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, arguably, I'm not at the top either since the summer mm -hmm. that I had. So, uh, you know, things happen. Cards uh, are weird. And so those are two players that I like to mention because of uh, the respect that I have, especially in the games where I consider myself good. Mm -hmm. And I think they're monsters in both. Very cool. So. Very cool. And our final question for you, Max, comes from Baloo1982. Who do you consider to be the toughest player who you've played against in recent years? Well, they're kind of a similar to the, to the question before, um, Perhaps. in a way. Um, Maybe someone who's held I, over you at the poker so you can't seem to get them. <laughs> Let me name a different player, okay. which I always saw, which I actually was proud. One of my two rings was a heads-up match against him in a small tournament at Harris, uh, Michael Mitraki, oh, which I haven't seen this summer. Yeah. yeah, the grinder. He had he has a game that is completely different than others in mixed game, and yet he was able to win uh, the, the big 50K two times? Three times. Three times? Three times. Three times. Yeah. It's absurd for the way that he, <laughs> he plays, but because he has a particular way to approach the game. So, hmm. uh, as I have to say, I actually did beat him heads up in No Limit, which is crazy, uh -huh. but I love the way he played. And, you know, it, when I faced him, I always feel uh, different. There was a, a, other two to mention, which I always thought they were extremely good and weird uh, David Benjamin uh, he didn't come this year he was oh. really good for a long time he also has a game that is just bothers me he looks like kind of <laughs> uh, I don't match up with him well right right and Scott Seaver is another mm. one that is uh, extremely good for some reason too he kind of sees through me in, uh, hmm. in certain situations. Interesting. And we're talking about Stad or Stad Ilo. So like with Scott Skiver, I'm not afraid to gamble with him because I cannot get um, in a situation where, 
he, he, he you know he holds over me so uh -huh, if he right. comes at the game i have no problem taking a 45 percent against him right in any spot or even a 42 or why because i rather eliminate him right and not having <laughs> him at the table than huh. maybe he makes all kinds of move against me. interesting stuff some really tough players there uh folks thank you very much for sending in your questions for max pescatori and again a friendly reminder to all of you out there in the cards chat community we would love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. Max, uh, you've given us so much of your time. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, before we let you go, Thank is you, there any, sure. is there anything else uh, that you'd like to tell uh, our audience before we let you go? I mean, uh, it was fun, uh, easy, and uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> it was a pleasure. Well, good. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in once again to another episode of Cards Chat. Please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you like the show. Until next time, I'm Robbie Straczynski, and you can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town from the world's number one poker community.